On the line now, though, uh, someone closer to home, David Clark from Arrowtown. Hey, uh, kia ora, Dave. How are you? Good. How yeah. are you? Yeah, well, uh, I'm, you know, I'm still taking in everything in a way, and, and I suppose uh, everyone is, and it impacts you because you're going to collect a QSM tomorrow. Uh, yeah, fly up tomorrow, and then the ceremony is on Wednesday. So the last group to get a a Queen's Service Medal with the Queen's head on it. So that's sort of a historic occasion. Mm. And, um, of course, it was going to be presented by the Governor-General, but she's got other things to do at the moment. So um, um, we got a note to say that it would be the Vice Governor-General, and I had no idea there was a Vice Governor-General, but well, someone who um, acts in her capacity if she can't do it. Okay, and you received this for services to uh, to heritage, didn't you? And and history heritage protection. Yeah. Yes, protection. Yeah. That's right. Which has been something that you've been passionate about for years. And but I want to go right back because we we need to talk about 1990 and that day when uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, visited Arrowtown and your museum. Yes, uh, I've been on the job about five months and. After about three months, we got a visit from the um, advance guard saying that the Queen was coming and she um, they expressed an interest in her coming to Arrowtown and especially to the museum because her mother had visited the museum in 1966 and this was going to be a repeat visit. She wasn't going to come into the museum. She was just going to come up the steps and could I organise a display on the steps and foyer of the museum, which I did, uh, mainly around her mother's visit and photos from that visit. And then we set up a table with a visitor's book and also um, a poster of the royal couple, uh, Philip and the Queen, um, which we were told she would sign. But when she came up, I had a pen already for her to sign this poster and it was shiny. And I didn't want ink to smudge, so I got a quick drying pen. And when she came up, she said, no, she wasn't going to um, sign that. But she would sign the visitor's book. Right. So um, I said, handed her the pen, and she said, oh, no. And the lady-in-waiting came over and pulled out a, a beautiful Parker pen, and she signed the visitor's book. And, and funnily enough, um, when I compared it later with the Queen Mother signature in 1966, they were almost identical and quite un unusually... Um, done with a, a very distinct E, so I'm wondering if they got coached by similar yes. um, people on how to sign. And I noticed when Charles was signing his declaration the other day, it looked a very similar um, signature with the R for Rex. It'll be Charles Rex, and the Queen was Elizabeth Regina, so both mean King or Queen, I suppose, in Latin. And then also Philip signed the visitors' book as well. So they'd, they'd had a a wonderful morning in Arrowtown walking through the main street with the then Mayor David Bradford and his wife Wendy and um, looked at various activities up the main street, a huge crowd. Yeah, I was going to ask you how, how popular, you know, was she then? Like, what was it Was it really packed, was it? Oh, yeah, it was just like, you know, I remember um, going to the showgrounds in Invercargill in 1970 and... I was in scouts then and we had to dress up as all different scouts from around the world on the back of this float and I got chosen to be Indonesia. Which, so I had to dress up in the Indonesian scout uniform which consisted of white shirt, white shorts, a white hat and sunglasses which was quite unusual. Mm. And anyway, I remember the huge crowds then and who staying at the Grand Hotel and just, you know, people five deep in all the streets in Invercargill and it was a bit like that in Arrowtown. So... The attraction was obviously still there. Yeah, and you know the Queen Mother had had a, a huge legion of fans. But it's been interesting the last few days, just to note the number of people who have felt or have expressed their they some people saying they were devastated by her loss, which yes. I, I thought was interesting. And I saw I saw all you know all different types of people young you know young men who you think wouldn't give a toss and they seemed very yeah. respectful and and very sad well she's just uh, a marker in history and you thought she was going to go on forever you know um she was one constant in people's lives and as they were saying 94 percent of the population um only knows the the queen as you know the monarch the head of the commonwealth 
and all those countries, even though a lot of them have now got independence, they're still part of the Commonwealth. Mm. And so, and, you know, she was very true to her word and, and was a figurehead that people looked up to and she worked hard. And um, So I think that's why there is a degree of sadness that it's all over and, um, you know, we enter a new era and there's not going to be that long, you know, to come into the throne at 25 and go out still working at 96, that's <laughs> never going to happen again. No, no. And Charles has I mean, waited Victoria a long time. Victoria did pretty well. I mean, the circumstance of Charles, even if Charles does 20 years and William comes in, then he's still going to be, you know, 60. So um, that reign where you come in at 25 and you see the pictures of her, and I imagine my own children at 25 assuming that role and... You know, she was very brave. Extremely. And I think that that's what I said at the outset, is I think a lot of people, regardless of who she represents, and people get uh, upset about her privilege, and I get that. Uh, but yes. she was born into this role, and yeah. she lived and breathed it. And uh, yeah. y you've got to respect uh, that about her, no matter what your, your beliefs are about uh, republicanism. Interesting, I want to talk about your, your childhood, David, because you lived in a family with a very uh, a passionate royalist mum, but, but your father yeah. was not so much so. No, my mother, I think she modelled us around the royal family we had little T-bar sandals and white socks. My brother's name's Philip. I'm David James, both royal names. So um, we religiously watched the Queen's message, but my father was usually usually blowing raspberries in the background, much to my mother's frustration. But she had a great admiration for the royal family. My grandfather had been a professional soldier in both world wars and made the rank of colonel, so he you know, looked up to the, the royal family, king and country, fighting for king and country. So it was very much to the, the fore in our family. And um, I don't, yeah, I, I think we went along with it to some degree and um, admired the royal family. And, of course, later on, my niece, um, uh, my brother's daughter, worked for Prince Charles in Kensington Palace as mm. part of the um, Commonwealth Secretary team. Well, she was a li liaison officer between the royal family and the Commonwealth and had a very interesting few years in, in Kensington Palace. Now, uh, you were speaking off air earlier about the fact that uh, she was sworn to secrecy, but did you get any little bits of information out of her about her role? Not much, not, not much. Um, other to say that she found... She was raised on Stewart Island and her mother was a great um, organic gardener and she had lots of good conversations with Charles about his gardening views and um, admired him greatly for his views on environment and farming practices and all those things that everyone thought he was a bit kooky about a few years ago but have come to pass that he was ahead of his time. And she said all the royal royals that she came across were delightful but some of the courtiers were a bit backbiting about a colonial being over there living in Kensington Palace and, oh. you know, they were scrambling for the top dog position. So that was sort of interesting. But other than that, she was sworn to secrecy. Like they, they'll be saying, what's this Antipodean doing here? Good grief. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and my brother got to stay in Kensington Palace as well when he went over to visit her. So they set up a bed in her. She had a little apartment, so... Oh. The staff set an extra bed up for him to camp on the floor. I think. <laughs> Imagine. But he said the security, the security was pretty oh. intense getting in and out. I was going to say that. The, imagine the protocols and everything that, that he would have had to have gone through just to to have that privilege of sleeping on the floor yeah. in the palace. It was interesting when she came to Aratown that the police advance guard was very subtle and low key, and I always um, compared it with later on when. President Clinton came and stayed at Millbrook and the security for that was just absolutely over the top extraordinary and um, yet the Queen you would hardly know that they were prepping for a, a royal visit that was done in such a low key way mm. and even though everyone that she was going to meet that day had to have a police clearance um, the ability for her to just walk about and meet people was 
amazing, very casual. And you still see that. I mean, these casual walkabouts. Yeah. The Queen was the Queen was the first to do the walkabouts, and before then, you know, the, you just waved from the balcony. But for the Queen to go off course as she did it the first time and um, mm. start meeting with the people and all the security guards freaking out um, was part of her the way that she um, Braided. wanted to interact with people. Mm. Yeah. Hey David, but you know it must have been nerve-wracking for her staff in New Zealand because there were uh, two or three incidents and uh, I was there for yes. one of them, the egging, the Waitangi thing. You know, I mean, I cannot believe that she even went to Waitangi when I think back on that. Uh, yeah. You know, she never went, went returned again. But, boy, they are vulnerable. And uh, our country, you know, our little country, we have a, a history of, uh, of of protest, which is a good thing, I think. You know, we, we yeah. speak our mind. Yeah, yeah. But it's like yeah. there must have been some hairy situations for her. I guess not that day in Arrowtown, though. I suppose that was all pretty much full of people who no. admired her. No, yeah, yeah, all sweetness and light, and you know, um, young girls giving her bunches of flowers, and it was um, it was a lovely day and one that I'll remember. And um, later on, of course, my mother got to because my um, niece worked with Charles when he came. Gosh, when did he come? Probably about 2017 or 18, round about then. He came to Dunedin and. Um, I think my niece managed to engineer Charles um, coming and seeing my mother, who was then in a wheelchair in the streets of Dunedin, and saying hello to her, which was a great thrill for her. So she at least met one of the royals. She belonged to something called the Royal Overseas League, and um, ah. they would have regular meetings and discuss the royal family. She tried to get me to join because you can stay in a rather nice little flat in London if you join for a reasonable price. But <laughs> I <don't. laughs> She didn't convince me. It wasn't enough to win you over. Oh. Maybe now I can show my QSM and get a discount. Yeah, maybe. You know, it's um, yeah, you know, it's it was an interesting time for you. So, what was your reaction when you heard about her going? I mean, because I think everyone, after seeing the photo with Liz Truss, we all we all got a bit yes. shocked because we thought she yes. was fine. Yes. No, forty-eight hours later, and um, Wendy was listening. My wife was in listening to the radio early, and then I got a nudge, the Queen's dead, and I couldn't believe it. I said, what? Uh, because we had just seen her, you know, seeing Boris off and meeting the next Prime Minister, the whatever it was, number 16 or something, wasn't it, in her reign. Mm. So, um, yeah, it came as a shock, and then obviously I've just been watching everything since. Um, you know, I've enjoyed those documentaries where they show early photos from the family albums Yes. That you haven't seen before. A lot of it you've seen before, but um, those ones where they're quite candid have more fascination for me. Yeah, same. I, I have, uh, I had to tell Phil to turn it off on the weekend because I said, look, it's too much. <laughs> you've just got, yeah. to, you're, you're gorging on it. <laughs> now you just need to settle down a wee bit. And he's like, oh, look at Harry and, and William. And I'm like, oh, Philip. But, you know, like I, I get the fascination and I, but I, I'm with you. I love uh, some, of, some of the historical footage because let's face it, it's history and our world was different. You know, like if you see her yeah. on, on a boat somewhere and you're like, okay, my goodness, she was well travelled and 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 so well informed and so bright and such a great diplomat. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, amazing radiant smile that she had that going through. You know, both her and Margaret were beautiful girls, really, and you could see why she uh, fell for Philip too. He looked very dashing in a oh, absolutely as well. Philip Philip was yeah. was the total Greek babe. He was gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> he was. I mean, she was but smitten with him. You could see it. Yeah, and she was only what twenty one or something, wasn't she? Oh yeah. But she, um, you could see why they liked it, why she loved Balmoral. You know, the shots of her just going in to get sausages at the local butchery, and she could wander around a bit without being constantly hassled. And um, you know, all the things that she liked doing: walking and horse riding and. I was thinking running her corgis around if you can run a corgi around. Yeah, I've never seen them run that fast. <laughs> <laughs> they nip your ankles. They're meant for the as cattle dogs, aren't they? Or? I believe so. They're they're cute. I was very interested to read that uh, Prince Andrew and Fergie are um, going to get uh, custody of of. They're of, getting a couple of them. A I couple think of Anne's them. Getting a couple of them. Mm. 
Yeah. And you know, um, it was also interesting because I heard that uh, the the Duke had actually bought uh, a corgi puppy for the Queen when he had to go to hospital and, and for, for company for her. So that made me think that really she probably didn't want to hang around too long after losing her Philip, did she, in a way? Like, I think Not she, really. she lost his support. Oh, well, she'd lost that, that yeah. rock that she had. Yeah. Yeah, no. Um, 96, though, it's pretty pretty good innings and to still get up and, you know, look at the papers. They get the box every day and open it up and look at all those royal papers that have to be laws that have to be agreed on or signed off or, you know, and it's a pretty tumultuous time in England and with what's going on in their mm. political system and Very much. the whole um, cost of living crisis, which is way worse than us. And, um, you know, mm. it'll be taking the minds off people because the English do pageantry like no one else. So we've got a a funeral and then we've got a coronation so they've got a a year at least of planning all of that but um mm. you could tell that they were prepared for this because everything swung into action pretty quickly and some of the docos i've been watching they've obviously pre-recorded it with um you know and the ability to put it out pretty quickly and um mm. but um i you know i just love that even though it must cost a fortune i love that pomp and so do i and um yeah. circumstance. I do too. And in that way, you know, the royal family as a, a tourist attraction probably certainly pays its way. Um, you know, people mm. begrudge the money that's spent on it, but I wouldn't imagine it would generate, you know, with especially the Americans, they've been sotted with the, the royal family. Mm. Mm. Well, you it know, does... They come and visit, visit all the homes and the mm. castles and the... Yeah. Well, it's got it's it's intriguing, and it's got so much history. And I, I think, as a Kiwi, that's what, what I liked when I was in London was being able to go to these these castles and palaces, and go to Hampton Court and see yeah. where, you know, King Henry was. And and it it, it is really interesting. And yeah, I certainly went know. to Balmoral. I think um, I got some shortbread at the Balmoral <laughs> Castle shop. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. So, yeah, so I did a bit of royal following. Certainly went to Buckingham Palace, and um, the first day we arrived in London, it was trooping of the colour, and it was the last time the Queen rode side saddle up the Mall, and that was in whew, about 1983, 84. Mm. So to see her ride this huge horse, and some of the shots I've seen on TV, the horses she rides are just massive. And I know. She's a great, great rider. Yes, I, I found and that she, too. Like, how many hands high would these horses be? And there's yeah. this diminutive woman on top, and she's fully in control, isn't she? And this was exactly like she rode up the, the male side saddle and just straight back, and then all the, the guards with the beautiful brass helmets, and the people were just five deep on that day as well. So that was quite special. Yeah, well, there's a lot of Kiwis in London right now who'll be um, trekking to Buckingham Palace yeah. in the next little while. Yeah. Like, if you were there, you'd, you'd certainly be uh, soaking up the pageantry and the the atmosphere. And the but but on the other hand, it'd be it'd be quite overwhelming in a way because because of all the restrictions on uh, you know the, the the presenters all wearing black. I think it's for a period of ten. There's many more days that this period is 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 uh, is followed. And there's yeah. certain things you can't I mean, do like and say. Nothing we've, nothing we've ever gone through before. Um, you know, the last huge occasion would have been King George VI, but probably um, the funeral of Victoria was massive, I would imagine. But mm. um, this is the first sort of televised, that whole um, changeover is the first time it was televised, the proclamation of the, the king, mm. the new king. So that's a whole new era that no one's ever experienced. There's one seeing what happens behind the scenes. Oh, I, I think so too, and it, it is very public. I uh, it must be awful uh, for uh, the royal children uh, being in such a spotlight at such a tricky time. But you know, there's one yeah. positive thing that's come out of it um, is that I read uh, this morning that all, all strike action has been cancelled in the UK uh, because of your <laughs> passing. And I thought, well. That's good, because I think there were nurses, there were all sorts of things uh, planned. Yes. And oh, pe gosh. people have uh, put that to one side. It's like, no, yeah. we're, we're focusing on one woman right now. Yeah. All we've got to focus on is whether we're going to, there's going to be a holiday or not. 
That's well, if they made the decision, I don't know if they made the decision on that. Do you know, I'm waiting for that because, and then people are grumbling at the moment about whether employers have to pay, right, for that, yes. um, you know, for that holiday. I'd imagine that we will because would, how, what do you think it would look like to the rest of the world if we didn't yeah. do that? Yeah. I yeah, mean... The rest of the Commonwealth countries, have, I remember when they came to town, they used to always give you a holiday, whether that, that was just the school kids. You know, if they arrived in Invercargill, the Queen would proclaim a, a holiday for, you know, such and such a day. That's right. So, yeah, I, I, I suppose I suppose we will. Uh, what did you make of, just before we go, what did you make of uh, King Charles III's uh, sort of uh, speech, uh, his, his, his comments once, uh, you know, once the, uh, the, the Queen had gone? Uh, I thought he was pretty, pretty good. Very good. Very good. His intonation, his delivery. Sometimes, you know, he can come across as a little bit, a little bit pompous, but I th- thought that was delivered beautifully. So, um, you know, someone said he's had plenty of practice, but um, you know, it was a good opening speech for for his reign. That's for sure. Yeah. And, of course, uh, with his consort, Camilla. And probably yeah. just as well uh, that, uh, yes, that uh, that he ended up uh, marrying her because it seems to give him some kind of a strength. Uh, it, they definitely do seem, uh, seem suited. And won't it be strange for her, though, because I've actually heard reports, I don't know if it's true, that she's actually reasonably shy and not that keen on being in the public eye too much, so it's going to be a huge change for her. Gosh, yes. Queen consort and the Queen recognised all the work that she'd done behind the scenes. You know, the great love of his life, really, and um, he wasn't able to marry her initially, so um, for him to have her support now is going to be great for him, but as you say, um, apparently she's got a, you know, from my informed sources, um, has got a great sense of humour. So that'll carry her a long way. And it looks like she, you know, they have a lot of fun together. Because he's a, yeah. you know, Charles is a great fan of the Goon Show and... <laughs> Monty you know, Python. All, uh, <laughs> and Monty Python and all that mad comedy stuff. So, um, you know, it's nice that they've got a, that sense of humour together. Man, I think you'd need it. And, and that's what the Queen seemed to have in spades too. She had a sense of oh, humour. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You've got to have a sense of humour. Imagine the things and that they have to see and put up with in it. that job. The, the thing that stands yeah. out the most for me with the Queen is: Do you remember that time the intruder broke into her bedroom and and yeah. and, and how with how cool was she? I mean, how cool yeah. is a cucumber? No one around, yeah. and it, boy, that yeah. would have been absolutely terrifying, and that could have ended so much worse. I mean, she she could have been killed yeah. easily. Yeah. Well, that guy in Dunedin tried to kill her. You know, he fired a rifle. He was never going to hit her. He was, mm. Slightly crazy. What was his name? Christopher Lewis. Yes, that's right. That was when in eighty one or eighty two, I think. Can't remember. Get my da- get my royal tour dates confused. Oh come on, David! You're getting your QSM this week. <laughs> you could do better. <laughs> come on! I should have swatted. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Hey, I've just had a text in actually from Hughes, who's a regular listener, and he said that uh, the horses. You know, we were discussing these giant creatures the Queen would ride, and he said they were 18 hands high Canadian mounted horses. Yeah, they yeah. were big black beauties, weren't they? Oh, amazing! One of my great memories, which is not a royal topic, is going to Wembley and seeing Scotland play England the last time they played football together and there was something like 80 or 90,000 in Wembley and as you uh, spat out the exits they had these huge armed, um, mounted policemen to try and control the crowds and I just remember almost being able to walk underneath them. They were just massive but a brilliant way to control a huge amount of people. They just funneled you in one direction and you didn't dare try to object. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I can imagine. Oh, look, honestly, so it's going to be a, a, an interesting week for you and, and an emotional one and a, a great tribute yeah. that you've, you know, you've got this heritage uh, protection uh, honour uh, and, and yeah. you said that you probably think you'll sign the condolence book uh, for the Queen as well when you're there. Yeah, yeah I'm going, definitely going to the Beehive and sign it there. Um, do the whole Wellington thing, you know, because um, while I'm there, why wouldn't, wouldn't I? So... And my mum would be very pleased that I did that. Mm. Yeah, important. She'll expect important. me to have my shoes polished, a clean handkerchief, clean underpants. <laughs> oh, she'd be giving me the 
she had be giving me the whole lecture on how I had to behave. Maybe you'd have to wave a union jack as well. Yeah, I had pulling chairs out for ladies and opening doors and not being rude and not mm. being crude. Yeah, I'd have a five-page letter from her on how to behave. How to behave? How, how delightful! She sounds she sounds like a real character. Did she did she collect memorabilia as well? Uh, you know, from the royal. No, family? she she wasn't into the memorabilia, mm-hmm. but um, just admired her um, sense of duty. Mm. And um, you know, she was on a lot of voluntary things. Um, so you know, just service to the community, and she admired her service. I think that's where it all came from, and also that family military background. Mm. Yes, it's interesting how the Duke wanted a big military presence at his funeral when he passed, and that is a big part of them, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they you know they're leaders of all the. It was interesting about the Queen being made a colonel for one of the guards when she was like 15 in World War Two, wasn't she? Right, that's that colonel I've of forgotten the, that. It wasn't. It might be the Scots Guards or one of those. And then you know she was working um, in the auxiliary army, driving trucks and changing oil and changing cars, and she didn't want to sit around. Yeah, and you know that's that's what that car- ca- uh, keep calm and carry on mantra comes from and yeah. that whole that blitz mentality that the Brits have so strongly that like okay the world is crumbling but we are here and we are stoic and it's quite yeah. good when the, when when things are really unsettled I mean it's sometimes it, it's not realistic to keep calm when when things are pretty bad but I, I think it's a great message to to remember you know with uh, yeah, Ukraine well, looking wobbly. Yeah, it's given them something to focus on when things are looking pretty grim. But um, you know, hope, hopefully Charles can be a unifying force mm. and that they can get things sorted out there. Because um, yeah, it's in a bit of a, a shambles at the moment. I think. Mm. The other thing about the Queen is she survived two bouts of COVID, and in her last bout, she was actually continuing to work. Just unbelievable. I remember people messaging saying, for goodness sake, she's in her 90s, let the poor woman rest. She d-. But that would have been her choice, wouldn't it? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I know, tough. Yeah. Absolutely tough. I reckon. She'd have the be- best medical care that money could buy, but, um, mm-hmm. you know, your body, she's just got, obviously, good genetics. Oh, it's yeah. Her, you know, her father was a heavy cigarette smoker that put paid to him. Mm. But the Queen Mother lived to a good age. Mm, over 100, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah she no. It's gin, she liked a gin or three. I heard that in recent years, uh, she she only just stopped drinking in recent years. Like I heard, she used to have a, a gin maybe eleven or twelve, you know, midday most days. I think the, this is the queen. Yeah, I think so. I'm pretty sure I read that yeah. somewhere. Yeah, but recently, why not? But well, well, you probably need it if you're going to wade through another bunch of papers and meet some other boring politician, and you know. And <laughs> honestly, how <laughs> tedious would some? And you know, I felt so sorry for them. Whenever they came to New Zealand, the weather was rubbish. You know, it was yeah. cold, it was wet. They took them to the most boring places. I don't know who did the itineraries. I mean, thank goodness the Queen. Um, no, actually, who went to Stewart Island? It was um, Harry. Well, Harry that was Meghan. Um, because yeah. my yeah my niece who. Um, Work for Charles. I'm sure she had, because she was raised on Stuart Island. She had something to do with that tour, and um, I'm sure she directed him to Stuart Island. So, um, well, that's sort of what I intimated. She wasn't able to tell me, obviously, <laughs> but it seems it seems interesting that she had ended something up, to do with that tour. Yes. And he ended up at Stuart Island, and where he declared his desire to find a nice girl. That's me. right. And we all thought, oh, he might find a Kiwi girl, but yes, no, he went for the movie star. Oh no! Or well, she went, or she went for him. That's still the jury's still out. Yeah, isn't true. It? <laughs> true, true, true. I, d- I don't know. I don't know what to think about all that. I mean, I've read all Piers Morgan's comments, and you know, but I yeah. think uh, Harry's his own man, and uh, you know, he 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 made the choice. Um, I do imagine that. Uh, it must be perilous when you're a, when you're a young prince and uh, women are throwing themselves at you, and you've got to make that uh, make that choice. You know. Yeah. 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 I, no, I, I like I, I like Harry. He's got a got a something about him. 
I like him too. And I think um, yeah. I think the reason he's acted in the way he has is all because all dates back to the death of his mother and uh, his yeah. his feelings of you know he's had great loss in his life and and yeah. uh, you know it's, it's an amazing interesting how way. normal you know they're not they're not all normal by any stretch of the imagination. But it's amazing how many of them are and remain normal. But like you say, they're surrounded with great wealth and protection, but it doesn't stop you being, you know, if your mother's killed in those circumstances and what the paparazzi write and you're never left alone and you can't just wander in the hills like we can without someone hassling you or having a security detail, it must be a hell of a life. I think it's a, a huge burden and I wouldn't want it for anything, <laughs> you know, a day, no. a day maybe, uh, but not, no, I think it would be, um, I think it would be horrendous. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it's been really good to talk, David, and, and all the best yeah, this week. Yeah, and, you know. and you. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's going to be a fun week. I'll oh. just have to make sure I don't trip over when I go up to get my medal. No, you won't. Just go and make that's sure. Always my, that's always my fear. <laughs> no, you won't. You'll be fine. And just yeah. go and make sure that you've got your iron hanky and everything uh, all yeah, yeah. tickety-boo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And your okay. mum will be so proud. And no, well done. Seriously, yeah. congratulations. And, and thanks again for talking with us. It's great. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. David Clark, the director of the Lakes District Museum in Arrowtown, speaking about uh, Queen Elizabeth and his memories of her, particularly when she visited Arrowtown in 1990, all those years ago. I was living in the UK then, but I'd come back for the 1990 Commonwealth Games. But uh, this was uh, later that year. And uh, she and the Duke... Uh, walked through Arrowtown to masses of crowds in the day, uh, huge crowds, huge applause, uh, lots of uh, lots of excited people. It would have been uh, one for the for the history books, and certainly uh, uh, David remembers it well.